Out of the Closet Productions presents Shadows Over Gordova, written and performed by the Closet DM. Chapter 1 Out of the Fatherland In the country of Davros, south of Lake Lesra, the great southern road connects the towns and cities on the edge of the civilized world. This highway is often traveled by adventurers en route to quests both great and small, but the dust of this highway was kicked up by a strange group one day. A horse-drawn covered wagon sped down the road closely, followed by five hooded figures on horseback. Did we really have to piss off the cultists? An arrow flew out of the back of the wagon and narrowly missed the closest hooded figure. Well, they weren't supposed to know we had stolen the scepter. Two more arrows shot out of the wagon. These found their mark and dropped two of the hooded figures. As these riders fell off their mounts, the three remaining ones began gaining ground on the wagon. The gnome who had loosed the first arrow said, How are these ponies so fast? They're brovish ponies, mate. They're the fastest in the world. The gnome looked back and smiled at his halfling companion who had just spoke. Ah, well, I guess you would know all about that, chairman. Turning back to the pursuers, the gnome notched another arrow and shot it at the leftmost rider. This time, the arrow found its way into the target's chest. The hooded figure screamed and flew off his pony. Well, that was a bit dramatic. The halfling called Sherman grinned as he handed a fresh quiver to the dark elf who was shooting alongside the gnome. If only he had taken up acting instead of worshipping dead warlocks, he could have been performing on the Stronvoth stage in Lumberbrig. Well, now he's dead on a dirt road in Davros. Always the serious one, eh, Kelros? The gnome loosed an arrow, hitting one of the pursuers in the shoulder, and looked up at the dark elf. Someone around here has to be the serious one, Nadir. The dark elf named Nadir smirked, and then, quickly loosing an arrow, he finished off the rider Kelros had wounded. There were now only two riders left. Kelros took aim at the hooded figure directly in front of him, but before he could shoot, a bolt shot past his ear and hit the rider in the face. Sorry! Sherman looked up, bewildered at Kelros, while holding a now unloaded crossbow in his hands. What did you think was going to happen when you started playing around with the loaded crossbow? I didn't know it was loaded. Kelros stared with his mouth slightly open at the halfling's remark. Nadir saw that an argument was brewing and quickly interjected while notching another arrow. Let it go, Kelros. It all worked out. Nadir aimed and loosed his arrow. It slammed into the last rider's chest and he flew off his mount without a sound. That guy should have taken acting lessons from the other one. Well, that was the last of them, for now at least. Hey, Garinar, we're not being chased anymore. We can slow it down. A face which had the features of both a human and an orc appeared between the gap and the front flaps. Good to hear, but if it's all the same, I don't want to slow down until we get to Salk. As Garinar's face disappeared to refocus on driving, a more wrinkled and rosier face occupied the space just vacated by the half-orc. I'm surprised they chose to die rather than break off their pursuit. I guess that should be expected from cultists. I I suppose that's true. We have a little cult of our own up in Dredemir. They worship Mount Rondrak, the volcano. They believe they will be cleansed in the fires and walk the earth as gods. Well, that's pleasant, Tidris. You dwarves sure know how to pick your gods. Sherman laughed at Nadir's remark while Kelros opened a crate lying in the middle of the wagon. Everyone grew quiet and watched as Kelros lifted the ancient scepter out of its box. Garanar, the road! Eyes on the road! Oh, right! The wagon swerved and a herd of cows mooed at the near collision. Who put those cows there? Probably my cousin. Really? Uh, no, that that was a joke. Oh, well, at least you tried. Garanar sighed heavily as Nadir and the dwarf named Tydris tried to stifle their laughter. Kelros was still too wrapped up in the scepter to notice anything that was happening. Laying the piece horizontally across his lap, he asked, uh, what do we know about this, um... Ah, I can never remember the client's name. Pero Belheis. Yeah, him. What's his story? Tydris looked back at his young gnome friend with a face that only a father could give to a son. The dwarf cleared his throat and said in a professorial tone, Pero Belheis is none other than the founder and head curator at the Museum of Barco Gordovan Civilization on Silceran Island. I assume this artifact will soon be in an exhibit. What do you think it is, Tydris? Kelros picked the scepter up off his lap and handed it over to Tydris. The dwarf took the item, handling it carefully as if it were the unstable concoction of an alchemist. After looking it over for a moment, Tydris waved his hand over the head of the scepter while muttering some incantation. As soon as he finished, the head of the scepter glowed, obviously radiating a magical energy. Hmm, I suspected as much. What? What is it? 
This scepter possesses magical qualities. What it is exactly, I cannot say, but it seems to be some sort of elemental-based power. Garinar turned his head to look at Tydris in the scepter before saying, Then maybe it's not such a good idea to give it over to a museum. Tydris didn't respond. He seemed lost in thought. Tydris? Tydris! Ah, yes, apologies. Tydris then paused a moment before continuing. I don't think it's up to us to decide whether or not this belongs in a museum or under lock and key in some vault. We are being paid to deliver this scepter, and deliver it we shall. No need to make things complicated, said Sherman as he picked up his lute and began playing a song. Out of my fatherland, we pulled a great sleight of hand, and the cultists gave chase, I shot one in the face, and for that I received reprimand. Oh, for that I received reprimand. I really think your songs are getting better. Just be glad that you didn't receive reprimand after having shot me in the buttocks with a crossbow bolt. All's well that ends well, eh? Calrose couldn't help but laugh at his jovial friend. Indeed, his laughter became so prolonged that it spread to the whole party. Their good mood lasted through sunset when the outskirts of the sleepy town called Salk became visible by twilight. Here we are. No clue or stay for the night in this place. Calrose, this is your country. Where do we go? Why do you assume I know where all the inns in Davros are? said Kelros in mock indignation. Well, do you? Of course I do. I'm a gnome. Nadir and Sherman exchanged quizzical looks upon hearing this proclamation. Nadir said, Didn't know that gnomes had such a knack for finding lodgings. Kelros was about to reply when Tydris butted in. Please, let's have the location of the inn, Kelros. You two can resume your profound conversation after I'm asleep in my own room. Kelros sighed, but did as he was told. It's called the Bear on the Lake. Take the main road through town, then turn left down the road leading to the waterfront. Nadir looked at Kelros, obviously astonished by his intimate knowledge of the town. I thought you said you were from Jornan and never got down to this part of the country. Yes, that's true, replied Kelros. I wasn't kidding when I told you I know because I'm a gnome. Nadir was now more baffled than ever. Tydris chuckled from the front passenger seat while Sherman whipped out a piece of parchment and a quill. Gnomes... Always know how to get to the nearest inn. Everyone stayed fairly silent as the wagon passed through the gates of the town and onto the main east-west thoroughfare. The three riding in the back took down the canvas covering so they could see where they were going. Salk was a quiet place, but the locals did not equate peace and calm to bland and boring. Quite the contrary, the streets of Salk were magnificently adorned and well-maintained. The five companions gazed around in wonder, taking in the sights. Uh, Garinar, this is where you turn left. Oh, uh, right. Garinar came out of his deep thinking just in time to make the turn. Tydris eyed the half-orc warily, having a sneaking suspicion that something was amiss. What's wrong, Garinar? Oh, nothing, Tydris. Don't worry about it. I know something's wrong. It's fine. Don't worry about it. For the love of the gods, just Tydris! The half-orc glared at the dwarf and said, Do not invoke the gods all willy-nilly like that. Nadir, who was listening in, stuck his head in between Tydris and Garinar. Better not sit too close, Garinar. You might be struck by the lightning taking out old Tydris here. Without looking, Tydris' hand immediately found the dark elf's face and pushed him away. Getting back to his original line of inquiry, the dwarf said, Come on, Garo, tell me what's irking you. Garinar stayed silent. Tydris eyed him, and then a look of realization came over his face. Don't tell me that you're bent out of shape by me wanting to spin the extra coin for a separate room. It's my money. What's it to you? It's just a waste of resources you could put towards something useful. A good night's sleep is useful. Maybe when you're as old as I am, you'll understand that. Garinar was about to respond when Kelros yelled out, We're here. The wagon came to a halt outside an impressive yet quaint inn which sat right on the waterfront. Turning the corner, going parallel with the water, there were the stables. Garinar brought the wagon around to the side. He dealt with the stable hand who was there while the others unpacked the wagon. Sherman groaned in exasperation and asked, Do we really have to haul all our baggage into the inn? We're only staying a night, right? Sorry, mate, said Nadir, but we can't risk our stuff getting stolen. Before long, the wagon and the horses were squared away and the five companions and their baggage were inside the inn. A gnome wearing a bright green coat with white striped pants appeared behind the check-in counter. Good evening, gentlemen. How many rooms do you require? 
Tydris, not wanting to give Garinar an opportunity to be cheap, said quickly, Two, please, sir. Two rooms it is. The innkeeper went to retrieve the two room keys while Tydris undid his money bag. That will be six silver pieces per room. The color drained from Garinar's face and he looked as though he would faint. Six silver a piece? That is highway robbery. The innkeeper, taking offense at the remark, replied, This is not some dumpy roadside inn in Brode. This is the bear on the lake. Upon hearing the slander against his home, Sherman said indignantly, Hey, they closed down the inns that were attached to landfills. Before the innkeeper could decide whether to throw them out or not, Tydris intervened. We will take the two rooms here. Tydris gave the gnome the twelve silver. The innkeeper took the money and handed the dwarf the two room keys. Trying to regain his professionalism, the dwarf said, clearing his throat, Ahem. Breakfast is served on the second level terrace. We hope to see you there. At the sound of this, Garinar cheered up. You mean, breakfast is included? An audible gasp came from the innkeeper. Kelros came behind Garinar and began pushing him away from the desk. This is Davros, Garo. Nothing is free. The five companions slinked off to the rooms which were on the ground floor. Tigris took the one for himself while the other four squeezed into the one next door. Tigris agreed to take most of the baggage since it tended not to talk. After settling in, no one was really in the mood to go out and explore the town. They were all quite content to head straight to bed. Bidding each other good night, the lanterns were extinguished, and soon the sound of light and not-so-light snoring filled the air. Tydris had not even undressed or gotten under the covers. He was passed out, lying on his back, with one leg dangling off the edge of the bed. The dwarf was completely unaware of his window opening, and a shadowed figure crossing the sill into the room. The silhouetted frame paused, and looked around as though it were searching for something. It ceased its search when it noticed a crate, whose metal fastenings glinted in the moonlight pouring through the window. Stooping down, the shadow carefully lifted the lid of the crate, exposing the ancient scepter to the glow of the moon. It was reaching its hands inside the crate to lift the artifact when a voice rang out in the darkness. Stop! Thief! A blast of magical energy shot from Tydris' hands and sent the shadow flying back up against the wall with the open window. Not waiting around, the shadow leapt back over the sill and outside in one acrobatic movement. Just then, the four who were asleep next door broke the door down to get to Tydris. What's the matter? Are you all right? Tydris didn't answer the question, but exclaimed hurriedly, Quickly! He's escaped through the window! On it! Nadir was already back out the door when he spoke these words. However, Kelros took a more direct approach. Running at a full sprint, he bounded up and over the windowsill. Sherman was about to follow, but Tydris called him back. No! We should stay here in case the thief doubles back to get the scepter. At these words, Garinar looked distressed. You mean, they tracked us here? It would seem so. The three stood in silence, watching the window and the door. A half hour passed. Then an hour. When it was half past midnight, Kelros and Nadir returned. No luck. Didn't even catch a glimpse of whoever it was. The dark elf nodded his head in agreement. I couldn't find a trace of him. We searched practically the whole town. Well, it seems as though we snagged an artifact that holds way more significance than we thought. No wonder the cultists pursued us so fanatically. Everyone remained silent for a moment, taking in Tigris' words. Finally, Sherman spoke up. I should think that Pero Belhars could fill us in on the scepter once we get to Silcerin. I agree, said Garinar. This has been the most harrowing job we've taken, and I feel as though we haven't seen the worst of it. Kelros turned to Tigris. Do you think we should stay? Tigris considered the matter for a brief moment before saying, Unfortunately, I think it would be prudent to leave now. But what about our breakfast on the terrace with stunning lake views? A silence fell on the group until all at once they broke out laughing. A sixth voice loudly clearing his throat suddenly cut through the laughter. The innkeeper had appeared in the doorway. I'll make the decision easier for you. Here's your silver now. Kindly leave the premises at once. After his declaration, the innkeeper flung a small leather bag filled with coin at Tydris. He then spun on his heel and left in a huff. The five companions began gathering up their baggage and soon they were back to their wagon and on the road again. So, where are we headed anyway? I would assume the nearest seaport would be Jornan. Nadir stared at Kalros in disbelief. You've got to be joking, mate. That's got to be at least a two weeks' journey. That's quite right, said Tydris. We could possibly take a boat across Lake Lesra and then down the lower Casbon River, but we would have to abandon some of our baggage to fit on a passenger river craft. And to be honest, I don't know if a boat would be any faster than this. Oh, I guess that settles it. The long, dusty highway will be our path. You should write that line down, Sherman. That was, uh, great. Sherman beamed, not catching the sarcasm in Kelros's voice. 
At once he grabbed his quill and parchment and said aloud as he wrote, The long, dusty highway will be our path. They traveled through the night doing the driving and shifts. The sun rose with Nadir at the reins with Kelros beside him. The other three were peacefully sleeping in the back when one of the wagon wheels found a particularly nasty hole in the road. The wagon shook so violently that the three who were asleep all woke up on full alert. What's happening? I'll give you what for! Tydris rolled his eyes at his half-orc friend. Gero, I am two hundred years old, and even I don't say bizarre and antiquated things like, give you what for. Sherman, who was listening to all this after he discovered that there was no impending threat, picked up his lute and began to sing, I'll give you what for, you dare ask for more, I'll give you what for, what for, what for. Great, said Nadir, now I'm going to have that song stuck in my head for the rest of the trip. Kelros was about to share his opinion of Sherman's newest piece when he spotted something in the distance. Ah, I believe that's Fort Zankas on the horizon. Everyone turned to look ahead down the road. Indeed, a large structure with high walls, round towers, and crenellations loomed imposingly about two miles in front of them. Even at that great distance, Fort Zankas was an impressive sight. Having changed hands twice during the Zarin War, the fort was also the battleground for two major sieges. The five companions sat watching the fort in reverent silence. Then, as if prompted by some invisible conductor, they broke their gaze to look at one another. They were an unlikely bunch. Even though 17 years had passed since the end of the worldwide conflict, the wound still ran deep for a lot of people. The war rarely came up in conversation among the five friends. Undoubtedly, it affected each of their lives in some way or another, but no one talked about what they did during those years of constant fighting and chaos. It was just an unspoken rule they had. Every once in a while, one of them would casually mention something, without realizing usually, about a battle in which he fought or a fort in which he was garrisoned but none of the others would engage or ask questions, and the system had worked for the better part of three years, and it is why the five companions did not speak at all until the fort had disappeared from view behind them.